Good morning and welcome to today's online service from the North Dartmoor Parishes. If you listen carefully, can you hear the bees and the birds and the tumbling stream? Anyway, I was making biscuits recently and as I put them into the tin, I was lamenting that they weren't uniform. Some were bigger than others, some more brown and some had irregular edges. But it did cause me to think that that's a little bit like us. Some of us are decidedly larger than others, some more athletic, others more intelligent, and yes, sometimes we just feel and look a bit of a mess. The great news is that in God's eyes, we are loved just the way we are. And God's standards are high. My roses are just coming into full flower and I find myself often standing transfixed by the sheer beauty, the colour, the scent and the complexity of the petals. I guess we're all part of God's garden. And even though some flowers and plants are decidedly more spectacular and more beautiful in our eyes, it is variety that makes a garden, and each of us has a special place in God's kingdom, and are loved and led by his Holy Spirit. So let's join together, if you will, and praise our Creator. Let us pray. Lord, we praise and thank you for this morning. You are our sun and moon. You are the nature that surrounds us, the tumbling stream and the soaring trees. You are the petals drifting in the wind and the scents of summer. We are blessed to be your family and we open our hearts to you and offer our lives to your service. We ask this in the name and example of your son, Jesus the teacher of life. Amen. Let us praise God with our first hymn.
as we come together in our service, we realise we're not always aware of God's Spirit in our lives. If you will, let us join together in prayer. Father, sometimes we feel that life is hard. We're troubled, anxious and depressed. Sometimes we blame others where we in fact are wrong. We fail to be kind or fail to offer help where it is needed. Let's take a moment of quiet to reflect over the past few days and think where we could have been more loving. Triune God, our Creator, Saviour and Living Presence, who knows us in every part of our being, who restores and loves us still. Help us to go forward in the days ahead in the knowledge, peace and blessing of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son. Amen. Now we have our readings from the Bible. A reading from Galatians, chapter 3. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be reckoned as righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus we are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you done with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He, repl he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city, how much Jesus had done for him. Faith. I wonder how often you get the chance to talk with your non-Christian friends about your faith. And if you're watching today and are Christianity curious, it's a good place to be. I took confirmation in later life 
coming back after childhood experience of church, a yoga acquaintance heard about this and said, oh, that'll suit you, the certainty. Well, I was a bit hurt, so I didn't have the wit to tell her that, in my experience, being in Christ is anything but certain, and the Bible is really quite strange a lot of the time. The nature of faith and what exactly is the gospel and the weird stories such as the one where demons are transferred to pigs that run off a cliff, leaving a man named Legion healed and peaceful, well, I'm still Christianity curious myself to tell the truth. And I don't know how it is for you, but wonder and wondering seem to be part of the territory. However, I was grateful to Amanda for her provocative comment because it helped me to acknowledge the path of paradox and unknowing that does require the leap of faith. How do you explain faith? In his letter to the Galatians that we heard an extract from, Paul sees faith as bringing freedom. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Paul was talking to Jewish Christians who'd grown up with the Torah and uh, legalistic culture that emphasised observances and purity laws. Doing what the law dictated meant that you were faithful. Of course, then and now, most people of the Jewish faith um, have a personal relationship with God and understand him on a cosmic level much bigger. It's just that in those very uncertain times, the law enforcers, the Pharisees, had gone mad with it. Jesus himself, schooled in the Torah, challenged them simply by being himself, practicing loving kindness and speaking truth to power. And of course, he ended up on a cross, hanging there as a result. Paul, before his dramatic conversion, had been one of those Pharisee Puritan fanatics, famously pictured in the Book of Acts, holding the coats of the people who, who stoned the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Anyway, Paul goes on in our passage. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. Disciplinarian. That's been described as the slave in the household who would take the children to school ensuring they didn't get into trouble or stray. But now that faith has come, we are no, sub no longer subject to the disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. So here Paul is using the analogy of a first century wealthy household. The slave shepherded the, the children but had no real authority Whereas, through Christ Jesus, faith revealed, we are children of God, the higher authority. It's like the law was a guardian who held us until Jesus came, the time was ready, and we were ready. There is perhaps a sense of growing up. The text goes on, As you were baptised into Christ, you have clothed yourself in Christ. Then, as now, uh, a new set of clothes mark an initiation, monks and priests, or a new stage in life. A bride would have a trousseau in the old days, uh, baptism and confirmation have associated clothes too. And in yesteryear, boys would get a, long, uh, a set of long trousers and girls would move from pinafores to proper dresses. Uh, I mean, now men wear shorts all through their life, and uh, in later middle age, I myself quite like a roomy pinafore. But I digress. Being clothed in Christ, a new level of maturity, a new identity. And I risk mis mixing metaphors because we remain children of Christ. And indeed, I want to advocate childlike wonder and wondering. But maturity of faith involves putting aside a legalistic certain approach and embracing paradox. Though Paul was speaking into the first century Middle East and background of Judaism, Torah, 
In some places in the wider 21st century church, you do encounter a kind of legalistic certainty, a more human-made probably, and potentially abusive sometimes. There is a growing movement of deconstruction by folk fleeing um, a kind of certain evangelical church. And Richard Raw, an American Franciscan monk and effective popular speaker on Christian spirituality, has a mission to what he calls first half of life Catholics. And I'll put some links in the comments below. In a reflective moment at the end shortly, I'm going to suggest that you take a moment to think how you might describe your journey to faith and maturity in faith to a non-Christian friend. Although I've said faith is uncertain, and for thoughtful Christians, doubt has to be the flip side of faith. I expect for you somewhere, as for me, through personal experience, there is a sure knowing about the Christ who saves, the agency of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God. Being saved is a gift, charis, from which we get charisma is the Greek word and it appears over and over in the New Testament used by Paul and the Apostles. It evokes the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that we celebrated last Sunday but would do well to celebrate over and over. For me, resonating with the experience of spirit that brought me to Christ, the miracles or acts of healing power that are described in the Gospels, that was what drew me in initially. This, uh, and there's so much interesting hinterland to the story about Legion being healed and more than enough questions for a complete talk in its own right. But what strikes me is how awestruck or even afraid the witnesses were. It says in the story, then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes, Gerasenes, not sure how you say that, all the people of the surrounding country asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. Fear. So it can also be translated as being awestruck or reverent, um, but the story tells us that it was just all too much for the people. A good thing had happened, and it was amazing, but the local folk couldn't take it. Jesus' power was too much for them, too much for them to take on board. Legion himself was delighted and begged to stay with Jesus. Faith isn't comprehensible to people who don't have it, but if you do, it's the only option. And so to the last word in the story, which is Jesus's, Jesus replies, he replies to Legion, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Will you go home and declare how much God has done for you? It may not be so easy to explain faith, but telling your faith story, your testimony will be really powerful. And maybe I'll catch up with that Amanda someday.
Oh God, we cannot do your will unless you help us. Send the Holy Spirit into our lives to show us how to live. Amen. We ask you to bless them. For all who minister in our church, we ask you to bless them. For all who provide our daily needs, we ask you to bless them. For our families and communities, we ask you to bless them. For all who do not yet know you, we ask you to bless them. Amen. A prayer from the Iona community. Life-giving God, you have made a beautiful world of blue skies and green fields, of sunlight and birdsong, of music and laughter. You have made us to live in peace with one another, but there is not enough peace in the world. We pray for peace. We pray for peace in Syria, peace in the Middle East, peace in Israel and Palestine and in the Ukraine. Peace in our homes and in our hearts. You have made us to live and love, but there is not enough love in the world. We pray for love. Love for the bereaved, love for the sick, love for the lonely, love in our homes and in our hearts. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that you are close to us all the time, even though we cannot see you. You know how we are feeling and thinking, even when we do not tell you out loud. Thank you for listening to us and being ready to forgive and help us. Stay with us always, we pray. Amen. Hear these prayers, Lord, our God, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
thank you for reaching out and being with us this morning from your homes and gardens, cafes and kitchens. And may the blessing of God, our Father, who unites us, be upon you. May the healing power of Christ touch the wounds in our lives. And may his Holy Spirit reside in and around our every step as we go forward into our new week. Amen. I look forward to being with you again soon. Goodbye.